It's an invitation for John the Baptist to feel slighted, to feel overlooked, maybe even to feel like he's been taken advantage of. They're essentially saying to John the Baptist here, he's eclipsing your popularity, John. Now, Lord, as we come to your word, we remember that it is powerful. We remember that it is sufficient, that it is inerrant, inspired, given by you to reveal yourself to us, and that we can grow in our walk with you through not only hearing your word, but the spirit working within us to strengthen us and convict us and transform us according to your will as revealed in your word. And so now, Lord, as we turn our minds and our hearts to your word, we pray that you would speak to us right where we are, that your spirit would convict us of anything we may need to be convicted of, that we would more fully glorify Christ in our lives. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to John chapter 3. The good news is there are only two more sermons in John chapter 3 this week and in two weeks. Next week, Jordan uh, will be preaching for us. But uh, we are almost done with chapter 3. Since the second week of March uh, of this year, we've been looking at chapter 3. We've been looking at this conversation that took place between Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And as I said at the beginning of of chapter 3, this conversation is maybe the most famous conversation that has ever been recorded, the most famous conversation that has ever taken place. But we've also seen that this is a chapter, this this is a a passage uh, in which several of the deepest and most important doctrines in all of scriptures merge together, They, they converge together in this chapter. If you remember, a few weeks ago, I started off a sermon by talking about the importance of asking good questions whenever we approach the text. We always want to be asking questions of the text. That's one of the primary uh, means by which we gain a deeper and deeper understanding of it. So today, I I would start off uh, with yet another question that a diligent student of the Scriptures should ask on a regular basis, and that is simply this question— Why is God, through the pen of the human author, telling me what I'm reading? Why has God included this in his word? Think about it. There are infinite things going on, an unfathomably great number of things going on at any given point that the author could tell us about. So why is God, through the pen of the author, telling us what is recorded And why is he telling us at this point in the text, wherever it may be? This is a really important question to ask of the passage that we come to today. With the conversation that took place between Jesus and Nicodemus now behind us, it's now complete, John is going to immediately move to a totally different time, a totally different place, and perhaps most significantly, a totally different person, John the Baptist. Now, if you're just reading this straight through, this seems like a really, really strange move that that John, the author, would go from talking about this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus to another completely different context. But I would argue that the reason that John, the author, makes this change in context, this radical leap in context, is so that we might see a contrast of sorts That is, so that we might consider the similarities and the differences between the men we know as Nicodemus and John the Baptist. Nicodemus, on one hand, was a really prideful individual, a very prideful man, as all the Pharisees were. He saw himself as perfectly capable of living up to the standards that God had set forth in his word. He saw himself as good enough for heaven, didn't really need to be improved upon. He was educated, and so he was intelligent. He was powerful, and so he was 
very respected, and all of these things from a worldly perspective are really, really positive. But the truth is that all these qualities worked against him. He didn't realize that. But they all flowed from and fed into the pride of Nicodemus. And there is perhaps no greater barrier, no greater obstacle to coming into a saving relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ than pride. Pride is like a wall that you can't scale. John the Baptist, on the other hand, totally different story. He was a very humble man. Do you remember what he had said about Jesus back in chapter 1? He said that he wasn't even worthy of untying Jesus' sandal. Now, if you remember, that was a Roman, there was a Roman tradition that uh, a slave owner couldn't even have his most lowly servant unstrap his sandals because it was too menial, too degrading of a task. But for John the Baptist, this was a task for which he was actually underqualified. It wasn't too low of a task for John the Baptist. It was too high. So unlike Nicodemus, who wore priestly garbs and, and was a very powerful man and respected member of society, John the Baptist is the opposite. He was clothed in garments made of camel's hair. Uh, unlike Nicodemus, John the Baptist was a very humble, very humble man. Now, humility is something that we should all strive for as Christians. Indeed, we are instructed throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, to be humble. But it's one of those things that's kind of tricky. It's easier said than done, because if humility is your goal, then the moment you start moving in that direction, you're tempted to boast of how humble you are. But it was St. Augustine who wrote humility, quote, humility is the foundation of all the other virtues. Hence, in the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other virtue except in mere appearance, end quote. In other words, if you don't have humility, you don't have any other virtue. No matter what it might look like, if you are not humble, there is no other virtue that you have. And this reflects what the scriptures say as well. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, he says, All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if pride is the greatest obstacle to knowing and walking with the Lord, then to be humble We have to understand, to be humble is the greatest work of grace that God works in a person. And there's much that we can learn about being humble, about humility from John the Baptist. So today we're going to be looking at John chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. We're actually going to cover that many verses today. And the point of this passage is that true humility flows from knowing who God is and who we ourselves are. True humility flows from knowing who God is and who we ourselves are in light of who God is. So John the Apostle, the author here, sets the context for us in verses 22 to 24, where we read, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing John was also baptizing in Ainan near Salim because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So we don't have any idea really uh, when this might have happened. What we know is that it was after the Passover, that's where the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus took place, so it was after the Passover, but it was before the time of John the Baptist being thrown into prison, where he was eventually martyred by King Herod. But what we know about the context here is that Jesus came into the region of Judea with his disciples, and he started ministering there, he started preaching there, he started baptizing there. So this is another time and another place. This is not flowing right immediately after what we saw at the the, the first 21 verses of chapter 3. No, this is sometime down the road. Different time, 
different place, completely different context. Then John says that John the Baptist was also still baptizing. He was, uh, he was also still ministering. But what's interesting is that we aren't exactly sure where. Uh, it, it says Ainon near Salim. We don't know anything about a place called Ainon. Uh, it's, it's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, uh, but we do know something of Salim. Uh, we know it was a very small, a very poor uh, a very run-down area. Uh, one commentary notes this. It says, quote, around Salim itself, there is nothing at all attractive, end quote. And that is where John the Baptist is now at this point. So this tells us a couple things, a couple very important and very interesting things. It tells us that John the Baptist is not in the region that he used to minister in. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 tells us that Judea is where John the Baptist started his ministry. That's where he started out. But it also hints at the idea uh, that on the surface it may have appeared to have been something of a demotion for him to be ministering in this very impoverished, more remote area. Uh, but now Jesus is the one who's ministering in Judea. The place where John the Baptist used to minister, now Jesus has taken over that region, and he's the one who's ministering there. And John the Baptist is now in a different place than he was when he started out. Very interesting. Now, when John says that there was much water, he's not saying uh, there, there's enough water to go around, there's enough water for both of them to baptize with. Um, but what he's saying is that there were multiple streams uh, that came off of the Jordan River. Literally translated, it says there were many waters. So they were in different places uh, ministering, doing, doing the same type of ministry, uh, preaching and baptizing. But John's point is simply this. John's point is that at this time, whenever this time was, people were still coming to both men to be discipled and to be baptized. But this apparently did not sit well with some of John the Baptist's disciples. Uh, they had concerns. It raised a lot of concerns about the dwindling nature, the dwindling state of John the Baptist's ministry, concerns that they will bring to him in the verses that follow. So let's look at verses 25 and 26. It says, therefore, there, therefore, so it's causal. We're supposed to see the flow here. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So they're concerned. They're worried. Pride inclines the human heart to always be looking out for number one. Pride inclines the human heart to always be looking out for our best interests. That certainly would have described Nicodemus. Like the other Pharisees, there is every indication that he would have been the type of person to have valued things like prominence, position, and prestige among people. And friends, I have to say that this is an absolutely deadly mindset for those who would strive to serve the Lord. And that's one thing that we want to see here. One thing that we want to avoid is having that kind of mindset. We've seen churches in our area, practically in our own backyard, crumble, just be destroyed because of the way that prideful ambition sneaks in and subtly, subtly destroys the stability and the credibility of a ministry. We've seen it happen with the biggest church that's been in Seattle since maybe ever. But while that's certainly something for a church to be on guard against as a whole, a, a, the corporate body to be on guard against, the truth is that every single Christian is called to ministry, to service of some sort. That might not be leading a church. Maybe it's discipling your children Maybe it's evangelizing your friends, sharing the gospel with your neighbors, feeding the poor. Maybe it's some other kind of ministry like that. But every Christian on an individual level is called unto service unto the Lord. Every Christian should have the goal 
of being of service to the Lord, of being used by and useful to the Lord for the glory of Christ and the advancement of his kingdom. And just like pride will destroy corporately a church organization on a, on a corporate level, it will just as easily undermine and destroy the credibility and the witness of any individual servant of Christ if you let cry, uh, pride get the worst of you, get the best of you, take root in your heart. And this is what John the Baptist is tempted with here. He's tempted with an opportunity to be prideful, to look out for his own interests. And so a discussion, we're told, takes place between some of John the Baptist's disciples and a Jew. We're not told who that is. Um, could be Nicodemus, we don't know. Uh, but there's a conversation that takes place between uh, some of John the Baptist's disciples and a Jew about the, the topic of purification. And John, the author here, John, John the Apostle, uh, he doesn't elaborate a whole lot on exactly what that means, what that conversation, you know, what was said, what was said in that conversation. But it does seem uh, to have had to do with some kind of comparison between the the rising success of Jesus's ministry and the dwindling, the lessening of John the Baptist's ministry. So, in other words, Jesus's ministry is going up. And John the Baptist's ministry is going down. Jesus' ministry is growing. John the Baptist's ministry is losing popularity quickly. And some of John the Baptist's disciples were really concerned about that. They were bothered by that. And so as more and more people started following Jesus around, fewer and fewer people were going out to see and follow and listen to John the Baptist. And so some of John the Baptist's disciples took on this very worldly mindset, the same mindset that Nicodemus would have had, becoming jealous, becoming envious, out of pride, not wanting to see their teacher play second fiddle to anyone. And so these disciples of John the Baptist come to him and they, they, they articulate their complaint with him. And what they say really amounts to an invitation for John the Baptist to feel jealous, to covet the success that Jesus was having. It's an invitation for John the Baptist to feel slighted, to feel overlooked, maybe even to feel like he's been taken advantage of. They're essentially saying to John the Baptist here, this rabbi named Jesus, whom you, know, you, were, you were all gung-ho about earlier, he's eclipsing your popularity, John. Do something. Say something to stop him. They're jealous. And jealousy in ministry, in service unto the Lord, in any capacity, is a terrible, terrible thing. It flows from pride, and, and it will defile a ministry. It will corrupt both a person or an, or, or a, or an organization's theology and practice. One church, let's say, for example, one church sees another church um, experience exponential growth in their attendance. And so what is the temptation for the churches that are maybe dwindling in their attendance? Let's say one of them decides that they'll do the same things that the church that's growing has been doing. They'll use the same worship style, throw out the traditional hymns that they've been singing for, for generations. Uh, they'll use the same programs. They'll use the same marketing campaigns. And before you know it, hey, they might start seeing some growth too. But it's not because they've got their eyes set on the Lord. Rather, it's because they started keeping an eye on their competition. And so they decided to do whatever it takes to fill their pews. And so rather than being driven by faithfulness to the Lord and faithfulness to his word, they become driven by things like pragmatism, doing whatever works to make to reach the goal that you're aiming for. They get driven by pragmatism, pride, jealousy, envy, discontent, strife. But let's be very straight about this. Every ministry, every church, every individual servant of the Lord faces this temptation to some extent to make their ministry 
about something other than Jesus. The inclination of our hearts, friends, is always, always, always to make it about ourselves in some way. Our preferences, our desires, our ambitions, instead of making it about Jesus, his glory, and his gospel. And John the Baptist was no exception to that. John the Baptist was no exception, but his response is a model of the type of response that every Christian should have when they're confronted with this temptation to make their ministry about something other than glorifying Jesus and advancing his kingdom. Let's look at what John says in verse 27. He says, John John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. Now, as we go through this passage, John's response here, I want us to really be careful, really, really uh, examine closely the things that he says as all of these verses, all the things that he says reveal a deep confidence and a deep contentment with the state of his ministry, which flows from the deep sense of humility that he lived by. So what he says in this verse and the verses that follow are are worthy of very careful attention because they don't just show us what John was thinking or what he was feeling, but they instruct us in feeling and thinking and responding to temptation in a way that glorifies Christ the same way John did. But what he says right here, right out of the gate, is a reflection of his confidence in the sovereignty of God. He says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. He's got a deep, deep confidence in God's sovereignty. It's true. Whatever we have, everything that we have and everything that we don't have, it's all ordained by God. That's true spiritually. It's, it's one of the central truths of salvation that Jesus shared in the conversation that he had with Nicodemus. As Jesus will say later on in John chapter 6, uh, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and no, man, uh, can, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Whatever we have, including salvation, is ordained by God. And I think part of the reason that John the author makes sure we see this is because this is a truth that Nicodemus didn't have his mind wrapped around, but this is the truth that Jesus was confronting him with. See, Nicodemus didn't get it. He thought that salvation was something to earn. He didn't see salvation as a gift. He saw it as a reward. In fact, I would argue that it seems very likely that John the author shows us this truth as a contrast with what Nicodemus believed and lived by. Here's John the Baptist, who is the opposite of Nicodemus in so many ways. But from the world's perspective, if you were coming at uh, these two men, John the Baptist and Nicodemus, with a worldly perspective, you would think that Nicodemus would be wise in these matters and that John the Baptist would be a fool but it's actually the other way around. Whatever we have and whatever we don't have is ordained by God. That's true spiritually and that's true physically as well. God ordains some to have more and some to have less. Think of the parable of the talents. There's one guy who gets five, there's another guy who gets one. Who gives those talents? The Lord does. God has ordained that some will have more and some will have less. Uh, God ordains some to have the gift of teaching. He'll ordain somebody else to have the gift of administration. He ordains one to have the gift of, uh, of extraordinary wisdom, and he'll ordain another to have the gift of exhortation. These are gifts that we don't choose. These are gifts that God sovereignly bestows. Whatever we have is ordained by God and whatever we don't have is ordained by God. So what difference does it make to have a constant awareness of that truth? Think about it. What what difference does it make to have this understanding of God's sovereignty? It makes an enormous difference. Because without this understanding, what will automatically happen is you will become discontent with what you have. 
It's very easy for that to happen. Without this understanding of God's sovereignty over all things, it's easy to be filled with jealousy. It's easy and natural to be filled with strife and envy toward those who have what you don't have or maybe don't have what you have. And so if God has drawn some of John's, John the Baptist's followers to Jesus, John the Baptist does not mind because he understands that everything that he has and everything that he does not have is all ordained by God. They're not his, these followers that are going to Jesus now aren't really his to begin with and he understands that. But do you see how this frees John the Baptist up to avoid the temptation to be jealous to avoid the temptation to feel animosity that his star is fading. Because he's not concerned with numbers. And because he's not concerned with numbers, he's free to simply minister in a way that is simply faithful to God. See, if he's concerned with numbers, as his disciples clearly are, right? If he were as concerned about numbers as they are, then while he started out ministering faithfully, he would maybe incline himself here to asking, okay, well, yeah, my my star is fading. What do I need to do uh, differently to draw some people back to my ministry? And what a horrible, horrible thing that would be. See how it sets a trap, having that kind of mindset? But John isn't ambitious about the numbers of people who are following him. He's ambitious about being faithful unto God. He's acutely aware of God's sovereign provision. And so, because he's, he's, he's content with God's sovereign provision, he's content with whatever God gives him or doesn't give him. And he's ambitious to simply glorify God through humble and faithful service. See, having this view of God's sovereignty is the key to remaining focused on God and faithful to Him when you're tempted to make something all about you. It's the key to avoiding selfish ambition in life or in service to the Lord. Having this confidence, having this understanding and this confidence in God's sovereignty purifies our motivation and it allows us to simply enjoy the gracious provision of God for what he has given us rather than feeling bitterness over what he hasn't given us. So whatever we have and whatever we don't have is ordained by God. Everything you have, friends, everything, every second of your life, something that you have, it's ordained by God. Everything you have is a gift from God that is meant to be used not for your glory, but for the glory of God. And one of the keys to remaining humble, avoiding pride and remaining humble, is knowing who God is. Because apart from knowing who God is, we will fail to understand even the most basic things about ourselves. Calvin writes this in his Institutes, chapter 1, book 1. He says, quote, Man never attains to a true self-knowledge until he has previously contemplated the face of God and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. For such is our innate pride, we always seem to ourselves just and upright and wise and holy until we are convinced by clear evidence of our injustice vileness, folly, and impurity. End quote. So in other words, we're tempted to think very highly of ourselves, but when you understand who God is, when you behold God, you can't think of yourself highly anymore. John the Baptist knew and understand that God is God and that John himself was not. He knew that God was sovereign over all that he had. That was the first thing that made him humble. And that will humble anyone who truly understands it. But this is why John knew himself too. It was because he knew God. He had a self-awareness because he knew God. He knew his place. 
And this is clear as day in the next verse. Let's look at verse 28 together. He continues, John the Baptist continues saying, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. So John, whatever his disciples may have thought, we know that some people thought that John was the Messiah, but John was not the Messiah, and he knew that. Now you might say, well, I, I know that I'm not God. I, I don't pretend to be God in my mind, so I don't, really, uh, I don't really need this. But what we need to understand, friends, is that we do need this because it's our inclination by nature to fashion our entire idea of who God is and how God operates, how God is, after our own image. That's our temptation, constantly. Even the most mature believer has that temptation to think of God in a way that is like himself. And this is why we must be firmly grounded, rooted in the Scriptures. Because every single one of us, as sinners by nature, would love to have a God who thinks and acts and is just like us. But if we know who God is, it'll do more than just make us aware of Him. It will also make us aware of ourselves. It'll increase our self-awareness. If a person knows who God is, then he or she will also realize what a worm, what a wretched sinner he or she is. I'm not saying that we need to hate ourselves. I'm not saying that we should be uh, self-deprecating or anything like that because it is possible to take this to the point where a man or a woman hates himself or herself and, and hates their life. So I'm not saying that this knowledge of God should cause us to hate ourselves, although it should cause you to hate certain things about yourself, such as your sin. But what I'm saying is it should keep you humble. It should make you humble and keep you humble. So John the Baptist wasn't upset about the ministry of Jesus growing because he knew God, and because he knew God, he had an awareness of himself. He knew that he wasn't the Messiah. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah, and he knew that the Messiah's ministry should be growing. So John knew that his role was not to be a Savior. John knew that his role was to point people to the Savior and to keep himself in the service of the Savior. When we understand that everything that we have is ordained by God, and when we understand our role in his kingdom, we start to grasp the importance of simply being faithful in what God has called us to do. He hasn't only called us to glorify him in our service, but he has also equipped us with the means of doing so. Think of what Paul writes to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, which is one of the most application-driven chapters in all of Scripture, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, he writes this. He says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Let me say that again. Not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. In other words, if you are thinking more highly of yourself than you should, then you are not given to sound judgment. But be of sound judgment. Don't think higher of yourself than you ought to. See, the church in Rome was growing very quickly at this point in time. And where there is rapid growth, there is always, always the potential for discord, for, for division, for, for disharmony. How were all these people who, who may not have even known each other all that well yet, how were they going to survive as a church without completely falling apart, without pride ruining everything? By being humble by not thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. 
This humble spirit would be the key to following all the instructions that follow in chapter 12. Love without hypocrisy, verse 9. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, verse 10. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, verse 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse, verse 14. He reminds them again in verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly do not be wise in your own estimation and then in verse 18 kind of the pinnacle of all this if possible so far as it depends on you be at peace with all men how are they going to do that all these things how are all these things going to be done in a spirit of humility see all these things are impossible to do without understanding God's sovereignty and without having a humble spirit. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves, Paul writes again in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Puritan author Thomas Watson put it this way. He said, quote, A humble man values others at a higher rate than himself, and the reason is because he can see his own heart better than he can see another's. End quote. What he's saying is, day in and day out, you should know your heart better than anybody else does, and you should be filled with thoughts that, when you see your heart, that, wow, nobody could have a heart as, as wretched as mine. Nobody uh, has a, a heart that's filled with corruption like mine. See, when you, when you see the depths of the corruption of the sin within yourself, you realize that you can't entirely trust yourself. You can't trust your feelings. Your heart lies to you constantly. And so this eliminates the tendency to think more highly of yourself than of others. So John understood what his calling was. It was to be a forerunner to the Messiah. But John had so many more reasons than you or I have to be prideful in his flesh. I mean, think about it. God had been silent for 400 years. Since the day of Malachi, 400 years prior to John, God had been silent. But God had gifted John the Baptist as the greatest of all the prophets, which is exactly what Jesus says about him. But John didn't think he was anything special. He didn't think more highly of himself than he ought. He knew he had God's calling on his life. He'd been filled with the Holy Spirit since he was in his mother's womb. But he understood that it was all a gift. It wasn't something that he earned. It wasn't something that he deserved. It was all a gift. And that the reason he was given this gifting was for the glory of God alone. The way to not glorify God in his ministry, would have been to have used all of his giftings in a way that brought glory to John the Baptist. But all the evidence that we have points to the fact that John never, ever wanted any of the glory for himself. His understanding of his role in God's kingdom is seen again in verse 29, but here we're going to see that he wasn't upset about it. He wasn't morose about it. He wasn't sad about his position in relation to the Messiah. Rather, uh, having that understanding of God and of himself allowed him to have great joy in his humility. So let's look at verse 29. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. So John clearly saw that his role was not a primary role. If you were to liken him to an actor in a, in a stage production or in a movie or a TV show, his role was a supporting cast member role. And there is no dishonor in doing well, doing excellent in a supporting role. The way to dishonor the position of a, of a supporting role is to use the supporting role to steal the attention, steal the spotlight from the main characters. But John the Baptist 
illustrates it differently than that. He illustrates it with the role of the friend of the bridegroom. Now, in our culture, we have similar roles in, uh, in weddings. Uh, the bridegroom has what we call uh, the best man, right? Uh, except the responsibilities of the friend of the bridegroom in ancient Israel culture, uh, his responsibilities were much greater than the, the responsibilities that the best man has in our weddings today. Uh, the, the friend of the bridegroom was essentially responsible for arranging absolutely every detail of the wedding, everything from invitations to presiding over the wedding feast. He was even the one who was uh, entrusted with the responsibility for guarding the chamber of the bride to ensure that no other man came to try to steal her away. But imagine a wedding in which the best man sought to steal the show. I mean, that's a really absurd idea, right? It's a really absurd idea. It does make for good comedy, though. Uh, there was a comedy on TV a few years back, uh, and in one episode, the boss, who is always, always obnoxious, that's part of what's so funny about the show, he loves the spotlight. Uh, he goes to the wedding of one of his employees, and he does absolutely everything he can to steal the limelight from the bride and the bridegroom. And finally, they just end up kicking him out uh, of the, the entire thing, of the, of the ceremony and the reception. But, but this is comedy, right? So, so that's something that makes us laugh because, because we recognize the ridiculousness of it. We recognize the absurdity of it. We, we, we see that it's, it's just silly to imagine that somebody other than the bride and the groom would be the center of attention at a wedding and anybody who would try to steal the attention. I mean, that's not realistic, right? But here's the thing. If your life... And if your ministry, if your service unto the Lord is all about you, that's exactly what you're doing. If you're living your life for your glory, that is exactly what you're doing. The attitude that John the Baptist has is that he's, he's the friend of the, of the bridegroom. He's, he's the best man. But his attitude about it is essentially, hey, it's, it's not my wedding so it's not my spotlight. So rather than feeling jealous, rather than giving in to the temptation to be prideful about the spotlight being on Jesus, John rejoiced. He was filled with, with, with joy over the fact that the spotlight was right where it belonged, on Jesus. He was happy to see that the bridegroom was the one getting the attention, getting the spotlight. That was the point. That was the point of his whole life, his whole ministry. And so John the Baptist had joy to serve in whatever capacity God put him in. He found joy in pointing people to the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the same joy, by the way, that Paul felt when he was beaten and imprisoned and chained to a Roman guard and yet wrote to the Philippians instructing them to rejoice in the Lord always. How could Paul find joy in a situation like that because he was humbly serving the Lord. His pride wasn't presenting a problem for him because he was being humble in his service to the Lord. He knew that God was sovereign. He knew that if God wanted him out of there, God could get him out of there. But he knew that if he was there, that's exactly where God had him at that time. And he had a sure confidence that whatever his circumstances were, God had ordained it for the point, for the purpose of Paul serving the Lord right where he was. If there's one way to be absolutely miserable in serving the Lord, it's to do it with a worldly mindset to adopt worldly values, worldly attitudes, where we're operating in accordance with worldly principles. Because those things only serve to take our focus, to take our attention, to take our eyes off of Jesus, which causes us to lose the balance that's necessary for faithfully serving the Lord. When I played soccer in high school, I learned that the best way to balance when I would stretch out my quads before a game 
was to find a single blade of grass on the ground and to simply fix my eyes on that one unmoving blade of grass. See, if you try uh, stretching your quads standing up and, and looking around, it's really, really difficult to, uh, to keep your balance. It's very likely you'll lose your balance. But if you simply keep your eyes fixed on something that doesn't move, it's actually really easy to balance. And the same is true in a spiritual sense. If we take our eyes off of the Lord Jesus, who is the same today and forever, yesterday, today, and forever, if we take our eyes off of Jesus, we lose balance. Think of Peter. Think of Peter when Jesus was walking on the water. Peter steps out onto the water. He starts walking on the water with Jesus until what? Until he takes his eyes off of the Lord. If we take our eyes off of the Lord, we will neither find balance nor joy in his service. So the question I have for you, individually, is do you know this joy? This joy of of humble service, of, of being humble and of serving the Lord from a position of humility? Do you know the joy of hearing his voice? That's what John says. He says, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Do you find joy in hearing his voice and seeing other people hear his voice? Where do we hear his voice? We hear it in two places. We hear it in our individual study of the word and we hear it in the preaching of his word. And I'm not just talking about preaching up here. I'm talking about sharing the gospel. In John the Baptist's case, rather than resenting the fact that Jesus was drawing more attention than he was, he rejoiced in it. He found deep, satisfying joy in it. This was a work within John and within the Christian that can only, only be attributed to God. It can only be wrought by God. It is completely against human nature to feel joy when our star is fading. It's a completely ridiculous notion to the unregenerate man that another should gain at his expense, at the expense of his own work. But this is why humility is such an important attribute for all of us to have. It's what leads to the conclusion, which really summarizes John's entire answer. Let's look at verse 30. John summarizes by saying, He, speaking of Jesus, of course, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, the thing that might shock us here is that this was not only the will of John the Baptist, but this was also the will of God. Given man's desire to feed and to protect and to live off of his pride, this has to be understood as something that man is never inclined to desire apart from God's gracious work within a person. God allowing a person to grow in humility by his grace, by seeing who God is, and by seeing who he himself is in light of who God is. If you want to be of service unto God and to find joy in that service, this is the humble mindset. This is the attitude that is required. When we love something or when we love someone else, we're willing to, to make sacrifices for the object of our love. That's just the way love works. And Christ demands our greatest love. It's that love that would draw you to humbly take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him, whatever the cost may be. If it, if it costs you your, your ego, so be it. If it costs you your self-esteem, so be it. If it costs you your job, so be it. You don't need it. And if, and if it's filled with pride, if, if, if your motivation is filled with pride, you, you don't want it. Really, you don't want it. It'll just poison the well of your motivation. Nicodemus didn't get that. At least not yet. But John the Baptist did. He was humble, and his humility made him great as a servant. Humility is the most glorious and gracious of graces. Graces 
that God works in his servants. However you have been gifted, whether you may be uh, gifted in, in, uh, in, in, in teaching or in exhortation, wherever you may be in any given time, let us strive to have the attitude of Christ himself who perfectly modeled this humility for us, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, as Paul writes in Philippians 2, 6-8. If we are reconciled to God, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, then we are to be growing in the likeness of Christ. And if we are to grow in the likeness of Christ, you cannot do that without also growing in humility. And you cannot grow in humility without daily taking up your cross and slaying the pride that would rise up in your hearts. If you've never trusted in Christ, consider how completely lost, completely oblivious Nicodemus was, even as he counted on his own righteousness, his own goodness, his own merit to receive salvation. See how his ambition was all driven by sinful, selfish pride Nicodemus didn't know the joy that John the Baptist did. He didn't know the contentment that John the Baptist did because Nicodemus' life was all about Nicodemus being glorified. And thus this passage is really an invitation to turn from your sinful pride and to find eternal life in Christ and in eternal life to find joy and peace and contentment in his service. Just like Nicodemus, I believe, eventually would. True humility comes from knowing who God is and thus who we ourselves are. And friends, there is great, great joy to be found in that. Because God owes us nothing. So whatever we have, we have by grace. Therefore, friends, let us all find joy and peace and contentment in humbly using whatever gifts, whatever time, whatever material we have with the same motivation that John the Baptist did for the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Our most gracious Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that it instructs us reproves us, sharpens us, refines us. Thank you for the way that you use your word to reveal to us what lies within our hearts. And we thank you for the example that John the Baptist gave by your grace. By your grace. Lord, it is our desire to be of service to you. It is our desire to be useful to you. And we know that that requires humility. So we pray that by the power of the Spirit working within us, that we would grow in humility, that we would have the strength and the resolve to put the pride within us to death day in and day out in order that Christ would increase and we would decrease for his glory.